morning, Grace. Let's stand and let's sing together. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone.
that we'd remember that sacrifice as we go throughout today, that we are free in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. His name is Lee Thompson. He's an alum of both Grace College and Grace Theological Seminary. He has served as pastor of Milford First Brethren Church in Milford, Indiana for over 11 years. He is the resource coordinator of the Midwest region of the Brethren Church. And he also moonlights as chaplain for our Grace men's basketball team. Uh, he also uh, played basketball here when he was a student and also ran track. In, in 2022, he's co-authored a commentary on 1st and 2nd Kings, uh, published by Siegel Publications. He and his wife, Stephanie, are parents of two boys, Tate and EJ. And I just want to personally share uh, that when I moved to Winona Lake to, to start my seminary here at Grace, it was Lee who invited me to teach along with him in Sunday school uh, at our church and, and mentored me and helped me in a bunch of different ways as I was trying to pursue ministry. I'm really thankful for Lee his ministry just north of here and also on our campus. Please help me welcome to the stage, Lee Thompson. 
Thank you, Brent. Um, yeah, the introduction, man, feels more impressive than I, I realized. Um, appreciate that, though, the kind words. Um, yes, if I, I look familiar, if some of you recognize me, um, it's because you've probably seen me on the bench, on the end of the bench at our men's basketball games. Uh, I've served as the team chaplain for the last five years. Um, Coach Moore and I go way back, and uh, he asked me to be the team chaplain when he started. And um, I cannot take credit for their success, but it's certainly been a privilege to walk alongside those guys, and especially this year, uh, such a memorable year and a, a successful year. I'm really proud of those guys, not just on the court, but, but off the court and what the Lord's doing in them. Um, yes, uh, Brent and I go back uh, quite a ways, uh, and um, I was, man, I was honored. It was really an answer to prayer when he came along because I was kind of ready to hand off the college ministry at uh, my then home church, and uh, it was perfect timing there. Um, and, you know, I, I consider uh, Brent to be a, a friend, um, except I'm starting to question that a little bit now, uh, today, actually before this. When Brent asked me to come speak, um, I was excited. It's a privilege to come open up the word with you uh, this morning. And then I looked at the actual passage he wanted me to speak on. And I was like, yikes, Brent. You couldn't have, couldn't have made it easier on me. Couldn't do me a favor. I'm, I'm, we're, we're friends, right? Um, I, I even wondered, and he s told me I could share this. I wondered if it was payback. See, Brent has come and spoken at my church, I think twice. And the first time he he came and spoke. He made an, an innocuous, innocent comment, a joke about how he was going to speak, but he wasn't going to be able to measure up to the pastors. He's talking to my audience and my, my congregation. And he did a fantastic job um, opening up the word and, and, and sharing. But after the service, one of my little old ladies came up, and she's one of those little old ladies who has no filter. <laughs> And she came up and she shook his hand and said, you're right, you're not as good as my pastor. Uh, oh, I f I'm sure he felt bad. I wanted to dig a hole right there and just crawl into it. I felt so bad. Um, so I think this might be a little bit of pain. I've been waiting years since that happened for him to. So when he, he gave me this passage this morning, I was like, great, Colossians. And then I looked at Colossians 4, 2 through 6, which is where we're at this morning. And... I was like, oh, boy, you stuck me with this one a little bit, didn't you? But uh, it, it's not that this passage actually is, is super complicated. This passage isn't full of complex theological ideas. There isn't any Greek behind the English that's super difficult. Um, it's actually, this passage is pretty straightforward and, and simple, I think we'll see. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. In its simplicity, actually, I think it becomes very challenging for us if we are going to uh, apply it. See, once you let these simple commands settle in, I think we're going to realize how challenging what Paul actually writes is. And I'm, I'm 43 years old, and I don't have a, a ton of wisdom necessarily I feel like I can convey to you, and I don't know if this message today will radically change your life or anything, but I do know this is that this passage is actually a lot like the Christian life in general. Is a lot of times we make the Christian life about a whole bunch of stuff, but when really the essence of it is pretty simple. And yet in that simplicity, it can become quite a challenge to actually live it out day by day, month by month, year by year. The Christian life is simple, but it ain't easy. And I think that's what uh, Paul is, is conveying in this passage a little bit, the truths he has for us. So um, if you have your Bibles, um, open up to Colossians 4, verse 2. I'll go ahead and read this short paragraph with me and follow along. I'm in the NIV. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may procl proclaim the mystery of Christ, which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So do you, do you see what I mean? 
There's nothing super profound or, 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 or even really confusing about this. This passage is pretty clear cut. And yet, while it's pretty straightforward to grasp, it's not going to be easy to live out and to apply. And, and I appreciate this letter, Colossians, and your study and your series this year, and how I know how you've centered your uh, uh, study on how great Jesus is and how he's calling us to live for him in all things and every facet of our lives. And you know what? If, if you're going to live for Jesus, again, it can be beautifully simple. We don't have to overcomplicate it necessarily. And yet, while it is simple, um, it can be challenging. And, and in the simplicity, again, the simplicity of this, these paragraphs, these sentences, two things. Pray for Christ's kingdom to advance. Live in a way so that Christ's kingdom will advance. Again, simple. And there's more to the Christian life than just those two things, obviously. But, but given the, the picture of Jesus and the picture of the Christian life Paul has painted in this letter to the Colossian church, Paul's settling on these two direct applications and, and, and showing us these are key ways we can apply this entire, entire book. Pray for the kingdom to advance. Live in a way so that the kingdom advances. Now, prayer being the initial focus of this passage, he asks them to pray, and it kind of tells them how or, or tells them what to pray for. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So pray thankfully, pray alertly, if you will. And he also mentions their clarity, I think. He asks, them, he asks for them to pray for him specifically as he shares the gospel. And if you've been, I'm sure you've been taking good notes on this, this book, you might remember Paul is penning these words sitting in a jail. He's sitting in a, a Roman prison. And yet, even, even there is an opportunity he sees to share the gospel, to further Christ's kingdom. He's, I, I find it interesting. You know, he doesn't ask for prayers to get him out. He doesn't ask for prayers that justice will be done and the legal system will, will work and get him out quickly so he can go on to bigger and better things. No, he, even as he sits in jail, he wants to share the gospel with those people around him, with the fellow inmates that might be nearby, with the Roman soldiers that are assigned to him. It's a pretty convicting and challenging and an impressive example, honestly, for, even for myself. I don't know about you. I, I find that to be uh, an incredible example of his perspective. Prayer, even in the midst of where he is at, where he is sitting. Now, I, I'm not going to stand up here and act like I'm some great evangelist or some powerful prayer warrior necessarily. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily. But those labels don't really matter. Um, all Christians, all Christ followers, we all have the privilege and the responsibility to pray. It's, that's part one of those simple things we all can do as Christ followers in our relationship with God. And, and here, he's calling us to pray for things that have eternal significance. And, and throughout the New Testament, um, it, it calls us to pray for the things that, that God prioritizes. Uh, pray for more than just our food. Pray more for more than just our good grades or test results. Pray more for than just our, our sick grandmas. And if, if you have a sick grandma, it's important to pray for her too. But if that's if that's the limit of our prayers, pray before our meal, pray before our test, pray for our sick loved one, then I'm afraid we're we're probably missing out. Do our do our prayers reflect the same kind of priorities that Paul? is expressing here. Are we, are we thankful even when we sit in a jail cell or some other difficult circumstance? Are we aware, are we watchful, are we alert about what's going on around us, how our roommates are doing, the, the kids in our hall, the, the, the neighbors in our neighborhood, what's going on in the world? Are we, are we aware of what's going on around us and how we can pray for that? And are we, are we praying for the gospel to advance. So I, I pastor a, a smaller church up in Milford, and, and we have a, a part-time secretary. Her name is Brenda, and she's in her 60s. She's a widow, and, and in her semi-retired season of life, 
Um, she's, she's found gardening to be a hobby she really, really enjoys. And last year, she told me a story that actually kind of connects to this point that, that really, um, uh, I, I don't think I'll ever forget it. See, la- about last year, about this time, um, um, she, she was getting ready and making preparations to get her garden, and, and she's got this cherry tree. Out, out in her backyard, she's got a, gar- a garden and a cherry tree. In fact, that's a picture of it. And about this time, everything was getting ready, and this was about the time of year when the, the cherry tree would blossom its leaves and the cherries would sprout. And about that time, though, because it's Indiana and Indiana weather, there was a, a, a late freeze in the, in the late spring right about the time she would have been expecting cherries. And, and she was worried and kind of resigned herself to the fact that she wasn't going to get any cherries this year, that last year. And she told me she was generally disappointed because a lot of mornings she'll get up, she'll kind of have her cup of coffee, she'll look out her, her kitchen window right where she can see her garden and her cherry tree, and she would pray for her garden and her cherry tree, and she would pray that God would help things to grow. Well, days and weeks went by, no cherries, and again, she's kind of disappointed and resigned to the fact that wasn't going to happen. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, cherries did appear, way later than they normally did. And in fact, she got more cherries than she ever had before. She told me 60 pounds of cherries. I'm not a cherry tree expert or a cherry crop horticulturalist or anything like that, but that's a lot of cherries. I got to eat some of the jam that she made afterwards. It was delicious. Um, And she was obviously very excited about this. Um, Kind of a surprise answer to prayer, really. And she's telling me the story, and and you're probably sitting there like, okay, that's nice. But what she said next, kind of how she finished the story, the ending of the story, absolutely floored me. She said after she had picked all of her cherries, God spoke to her and, and asked her, As hard as you pray for these cherries, what would happen if you prayed the same way for people? As hard as you prayed for these cherries, what would happen if you prayed the same way for people? Ooh, yeah. Um, Now, I remember sitting where you were as a student, where I was even spiritually, hearing a story like that. I might have freaked out a little bit about somebody saying God spoke to them, I understand that, um, and it wasn't necessarily an audible voice, she'll tell you, but as we kind of d- test and discern that question and that statement, I find it lines up 100% with God's will and God's mission and God's word, so I have no doubt God was speaking to her in that way. And w- what's interesting, after this, to her credit, she began a Bible study that really tried to attract non-church-going people. And in fact, in a few weeks, we're going to baptize an individual who was part of that Bible study, who was drawn closer to Christ and closer in their commitment to Christ because of that Bible study. But, man, I don't, I'm not sure I'll ever forget that story. If, if prayer can make a difference in a cherry crop, what kind of difference can prayer make in people's hearts? I mean... There are mysteries about prayer, to be perfectly honest, I will, I will never figure out, and I don't think we'll, anybody will ever totally understand how God, a sovereign God uses our prayers to further his plan. And yet, I just know, we're told here and in other places in the New Testament, God can and will use our prayers in powerful, incredible ways. He might produce fruit and results that we, we'd never see coming if we just would participate. So pray for Christ's kingdom to advance. It's simple, but it ain't easy. Even as a pastor, uh, I, I feel like my prayer life can go up and down sometimes. I know as college students, you get distracted. But man, if we commit ourselves to prayer, there's no telling what God could do. Now, the second half of this passage Paul kind of turns from our private prayer lives to our more public-facing lives. Another simple but challenging call for us to, again, live in a way so that Christ's kingdom, so that the gospel will advance. Read verse 5 and 6 again. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, 
so that you may know how to answer everyone. Again, not a lot to be confused about here. Not, not, not too much, com- n- nothing too complicated here as far as what he is saying. You know, how we walk and how we talk ought to reflect Jesus towards the outside world. It should reflect Jesus' greatness and his grace. It should be a, a good witness. And yet it's still not easy. It's, it's not going to be simple, uh, as simple as it seems even. He says, walk in wisdom and make the most of our time. That's how we should live. In other words, take advantage of, of the time, of the experiences, of the relationships you have. Use those things to share the hope of Christ with others. And the qualifier there, be, be wise and then later with our speech, may it be full of grace. Those qualifiers, wisdom and grace, I think those are important parts about how we live our lives if we're going to be a, a good witness to Christ. You know, Paul earlier asked for open doors to share the gospel. And, and I think if we, we do it wisely and if we do it graciously, we shouldn't be trying to pry doors open with a crowbar or muscling our way into somebody's life and force-feeding Jesus to them. No, we should do it wisely. We should do it graciously. Um, We should live in such a way so that people want the kind of faith we claim to have. And they want the hope that we exhibit. They want the Jesus we follow. It might look as simple as noticing a co-worker's having a rough week, offering them some encouragement, even offering to, to pray for them. Maybe for you, it's, it's an unbelieving family member who's really kind of getting on your case. But instead of lashing back out at them, you can instead maybe respond with Christ-like peace and generosity. Man, if we apply this well, if we live in a way that's wise and gracious towards the outside world, again, it can make an incredible impact, just like our prayers can and will. And one thing I'm I'm convinced more and more is that our world needs a better Christian witness. Uh, The the state of things, the state of the the church in America, you know, a few weeks ago, I ran across an article in the New York Times that it was describing how Christianity was on the decline in America and how more and more of our society was becoming secular. And honestly, as a pastor, I see these things all the time and um, honestly, you could probably find one about every week published somewhere about the demise of the church or evangelicalism and all of that. And if that's a reality, okay. I have noticed Christians tend to respond a couple ways when they read those things or hear those things or see those surveys. Sometimes Christians can respond by panicking or sometimes they, they kind of chase power. And I don't think either of those typical responses are good. They start to panic and start to blame other people and they blame the outside world and they blame this or that and, and, and they, they operate out of fear. Others kind of chase power and think if we can just achieve and hold on to all the, the, the power that we can, win all the elections, we can then feel safe in our country and, and then we'll, we'll be okay and we'll stop this, this downslide. You know, instead of panicking or chasing power, why not consider the potential of the reality that this is, is, is going to give us? This, I, I could see this as an opportunity. Maybe we can accept this reality and get back to like New Testament early church living. I mean, if this is true, if this downturn keeps going on as a trend, okay, that means you all will probably live most of your lives in this country in a culture that doesn't have a whole lot of Christian influence. Okay, okay, if our culture is getting darker, guess what that means? Your light can shine even brighter. If you be wise in how you act towards outsiders, if your speech even is full of grace and seasoned with salt. The New Testament churches were living in an environment, in a culture, in an empire that gave them no credence, gave them no influence, no power. And yet somehow, Paul doesn't tell them to panic. Paul doesn't tell them to rebel or chase after power. No. 
New Testament churches did transform their world by gospel witness, by gospel living. I think that can be the call. If we can get back to the roots of that, it'll be okay, whatever the future might hold. I don't want to panic. I don't want to chase power. I just want to see the potential and what God might have for us in the future. Paul's calling us to live lives that reflect the grace of Christ and even to the point where our words are winsome and compelling so that people want to know more. It can be the kind of life where others look at you and they might notice, hey, your, your philosophy on life is, isn't materialistic like everyone else I see. You're a pretty generous person. Where does that come from? You have, a, you have a hopeful perspective. You're not stressed and fearful about everything all the time. You actually listen and care when I'm dumping all of my problems on you. Everybody else just kind of waits their turn and just waits, waits to talk. They don't actually listen to what's going on with me. I want what you have. I mean... This can be an incredible opportunity. I don't want to be the kind of person who's doom and gloom about what's going on in our nation today. Maybe it, maybe it is doom and gloom, but man, this can be a great opportunity. And Paul is telling us, is encouraging us, man, if you pray for Christ's kingdom to advance, it will. And if you live in a way that Christ's kingdom advances, if you let the gospel take root in hearts and lives, just let God transform things, man, who knows what he could do? Who knows what he will do? It'll be simple, but it won't be easy. I, I don't know if any of you were like me, but growing up, I had these, these big dreams. Some might call them delusions of grandeur. I thought I was going to be an NBA player when I grew up. Um, a 6'1". I played basketball, but I was not that good. Um, I, and NFL, I, I, you know, I was a kid. I had these dreams. I would play basketball in, in the NFL. And, you know, that never happened. Spoiler alert. But even these, this idea of doing great things, this kind of God put it in my heart for whatever reason. And even as I'm, I realized athletics wasn't going to be the thing, as I got serious in my walk with Christ, I was like, oh, you know, maybe as I felt a call to pastoral ministry, I can, I can be a pastor who does great things for for Christ, and we can change the world that way. And, you know, that's okay. But for me, God graciously had to kind of teach me and correct me in a bunch of different ways over time that while those are nice aspirations, my idea of success and greatness, that wasn't necessarily in line with his ideas of success or greatness. Now, I've learned greatness in God's eyes isn't about doing the big things, but it's actually, I think spiritual su success is more about faithfully doing the simple things. And here, right here in Colossians 4, I'm actually thankful Brent gave me this passage. I don't have any ill will towards him. I'm actually thankful because this is another reminder. Man, if we faithfully do the simple things, man, God can, God can create an incredible impact through it. Now, they won't be easy. These are challenging things, convicting things. But this is kind of what following Christ is all about. Simple things that aren't always easy. You know, Jesus himself, if we're going to follow Christ, Jesus himself said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me. And to quote an old school DC Talk song, because if you know me, I have to do this. If we're going to take up our cross, we shouldn't be surprised when it brings its share of splinters. If we're going to take up our cross, it's going to have its challenges. It's going to hurt a little bit. It's going to be painful sometimes. But, man, for you, it might just be simply being a little more devoted and committed to, to prayer and the priorities that God wants us to have in our prayer lives. Maybe for you, it's simply looking and taking advantage of every opportunity that God puts in your path, to share the love of Christ with other people. Maybe it's simply having grace-filled attitudes or speech that's inviting to unbelievers and outsiders, making them want, want to know more. Paul gives us some simple things here to apply, but certainly challenging things. They may require a reorientation of our mindset, of our lives, of our goals, you may have to reorient yourself and redefine for yourself what you think success is, if, if you're like me. But 
man, along with Paul here, let me encourage you, pray for Christ's kingdom. Pray for the gospel to advance. And live so that Christ's kingdom will advance too. If we take up those simple yet challenging invitations, and li living for Jesus, it's simple but it ain't easy, but man, if we accept that challenge, there's no telling what God might do. There's no telling what God will do in and through you. There's nothing better, there's nothing more fulfilling and satisfying than seeing God at work. Not to our credit, not so we get the spotlight or we get the glory, but so that his kingdom advances. So the people's lives are changed through his spirit, connecting them to his son. Let's pray for Christ's kingdom to advance and live in a way that his kingdom advances. Before we dismiss, let me close this in prayer. Lord God, uh, this is challenging, and yet in its simplicity, we can see the beauty of your plan and how you operate and how you work and what you want from us. May we embrace the challenges and the challenging aspects to these, call, to these calls, and yet may we simply be faithful in these things each and every day. Lord, I pray for these students uh, that their prayer lives would uh, be transformed, be encouraged uh, to pray for things that are on the top of your priority list. And may their lives reflect well who Jesus is to people who don't know Christ. And Lord, as they become teachers and doctors and CEOs and moms and dads and wherever you take them, Lord, may they uh, be effective and faithful examples of what it means to follow you. May others want to know more about what it means to follow you through their lives and through their testimony. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that empowers us and enables us to do all these things. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.